Let's take a closer look at the question, when does a random variable have a Poisson distribution? This can be a trickier question to answer than for some other distributions, like the binomial and geometric, so let's take a closer look at a few examples and some things to consider when we're trying to address this question. I do not do any calculations in this video. This is a concept video. I'm going to assume that you've already been introduced to the Poisson distribution, but let's do a quick review. Recall that a Poisson random variable is a count of the number of occurrences of an event in a given unit of time, distance, area, or volume, etc. That sounds simple enough, but other conditions need to hold in order for this count to truly have a Poisson distribution. I'm going to phrase the following in terms of time, but the same ideas hold if we are discussing distance or area or volume, etc. Suppose events are occurring independently. More specifically, knowing when one event happens gives no information about when another event will occur. And the probability that an event occurs in a given length of time does not change through time. In other words, the theoretical rate at which the events are occurring does not change through time. A little more loosely, we sometimes say that the events are occurring randomly and independently. If these conditions hold, then the random variable x, which represents the number of events in a fixed unit of time, has the Poisson distribution. And here's the probability mass function for the Poisson distribution, what we use to calculate Poisson probabilities. And note that the random variable x can take on the values 0, 1, 2, off to infinity. There is no upper bound on the values x can take on. Thinking about the possible values the random variable can take on can sometimes help when we are trying to determine what the appropriate distribution is. Here's an important relationship. The Poisson distribution closely approximates the binomial distribution if n is large and p is small. This notion can sometimes help us when we're trying to determine whether a Poisson distribution might be reasonable. Let's look at a few examples here. Would the number of chocolate chips in a randomly selected scoop of cookie dough have a Poisson distribution? Well, here we're counting up the number of events, the number of chocolate chips, in a volume of cookie dough. So that condition of the Poisson is satisfied. And if the cookie dough is mixed up really well so that the chocolate chips are distributed randomly and independently throughout the cookie dough, then the Poisson model would probably be pretty good. So here, depending on the specifics of the situation, the Poisson model might be very reasonable. How about the average weight of customers arriving at a store in a 10-minute period? Well, here I'm just being a little silly. The average weight is a random variable, but it's not a count of a number of events. So the average weight would definitely not have a Poisson distribution. How about the number of deaths from horse kicks in the Prussian army in a year? Here we're dealing with a count again, the number of deaths in a year. And this one's a bit of a classic Poisson example, and there's a classic data set associated with it from the 1800s. If these deaths are occurring randomly and independently, then it would be fine to model this with a Poisson distribution. And in fact, the actual data set showed that the Poisson distribution fit the data quite well. But if we didn't have any data to back us up, it would be hard to say exactly. The independence assumption could easily be violated in certain ways. For example, perhaps horses go crazy every now and then and take out as many people as they can. So the first and third situations here are probably pretty well modeled by a Poisson distribution, but it depends on the specifics of the situation. And for the rest of this video, I'm going to try to help us visualize what we should be thinking about when trying to determine if a Poisson model is reasonable. Suppose we have a situation like this, in which these dots are randomly scattered throughout this area. I've done this in such a way that they are randomly and independently scattered throughout the grid, and the true theoretical rate of dots is constant across the grid. We might see a pattern like this if we put a piece of paper on the ground and saw where the raindrops fell when it was raining. Suppose we were to randomly select a square meter of this area and count up the number of events. This green square represents a randomly selected square meter, and in this square we have four events. We could randomly select another square meter, and this time there are two events. And if we did it again, this time we got one. Would the Poisson distribution provide a reasonable approximation to the distribution of the number of events in a randomly selected square meter? Yes. Here the conditions of the Poisson are, for all intents and purposes, perfectly satisfied. We have randomly scattered dots, distributed independently of one another, and the theoretical rate of occurrences is the same across the field. Here's a bit of a different situation. Here the events are distributed evenly across the plot. 
This has the same mean number of events as in the last plot, but with a very different distribution. We might see something like this as the distribution of lights in a large parking lot, say. Here, if we were to randomly select a square, this time we got two events. If we did it again, this time we got two events again. And if we did it again, this time we got two events again. We wouldn't get exactly the same number of events every time, but there isn't going to be a lot of variability. Certainly not nearly as much as when we had random scattering of points on the last slide. Would the Poisson distribution be a reasonable approximation to the number of events in a randomly selected green square? No, definitely not. The events are most definitely not distributed randomly and independently with the same theoretical rate across the plot. Here's a bit of a different situation in which the dots appear to be grouped together in four groups. We might see something like this if the events were not occurring independently and if the events had a tendency to group together. For example, cows in a field often look a little like this as cows have a tendency to group together. If we randomly selected a square here, this time we got zero events, and we'd get zero quite frequently since there is so much blank space with no events. If we randomly selected another square, this time we get 15 events, a very large number of events. If the events were distributed randomly and independently, and at the same theoretical rate across the entire plot, then it would be incredibly unlikely to get 15 events. If we randomly selected another square, this time we get a single event. Would the Poisson distribution be a reasonable approximation to the number of events in a randomly selected green square? Definitely not. The conditions necessary for the Poisson distribution to be reasonable are not met here. To summarize, here we have the three situations. In each one of these three situations, the theoretical mean number of events in a randomly selected green square is about 1.4, but only the top situation has a Poisson distribution. If we use the Poisson distribution to calculate probabilities in these other two situations below, we could be very far off and misled. Suppose we were faced with this question. During the week, students enter a university center at an average rate of 20 per minute. What is the probability that in a randomly selected 5-minute period, exactly 90 arrive? It might be tempting to jump right into the Poisson distribution here. We are counting up the number of times an event occurs, a student arrives, and we could easily say that for a 5-minute period, lambda is equal to the 5 minutes times the rate of 20 per minute, which equals 100. Then we could calculate a probability using the Poisson probability mass function. It's easy enough to force numbers through the Poisson formula, but whether it's correct to do so or not is another question. And here we shouldn't be too quick to assume the Poisson distribution. First of all, the rate at which students arrive would vary dramatically during the day. Between classes and at lunchtime, the rate is very high, while at night or during classes, the rate is much lower. But even if the rate was the same at different times, or we restricted ourselves to a strict time, like between 2.10 and 2.15 on Tuesday afternoons, say, there's still a problem. Students will not be arriving independently of one another. To illustrate that notion, I've created a few simulations. Here each happy face represents a student, and the space on the right represents the door to the university center. In this first case, I've simulated a situation where the number of arrivals in a given time frame would follow a Poisson distribution. I've set this up such that students are arriving randomly and independently with a constant theoretical rate of arrivals. But to speed things up for us, I'm going to have them arriving at a faster rate than what was given in the question. And that looks like this. Here the arrivals are following what we call a Poisson process, and the number of arrivals in a given time frame would follow a Poisson distribution here. Here's another situation, where the students space themselves apart evenly. There isn't randomness in the arrival times. The students are arriving at evenly spaced intervals. Students are not arriving according to a Poisson process, and the number of arrivals in a given time frame would not have a Poisson distribution but it would be a rare case where students would space themselves apart like this. Student arrivals would look more like this simulation. I set this one up so that there is some randomness, and many students arrive as individuals, so it might look a little like the Poisson process, like that first simulation. But I've tweaked this one in such a way that the students have a tendency to group together. That's not to say that the students can't arrive on their own, 
but here they are more likely to arrive in pairs or groups than would be predicted by a model based on random and independent arrivals. We still sometimes use the Poisson distribution to model scenarios like this, and it may provide a reasonable approximation in certain settings. But it won't handle a situation like this very well, where a large group of students groups together for some reason, which we might see when a bus arrives or when a certain class lets out. A large group like this would not be properly accounted for in the Poisson model. Let's look at one last pair of situations. Would the number of fatal commercial plane crashes have a Poisson distribution? We're counting up the number of times an event occurs in a given time frame, so that might lead us to think about the Poisson. And there are a very large number, millions of flights in each year, each one of them having a very tiny probability of experiencing a fatal crash. So that should be guiding us towards a Poisson distribution because of the Poisson approximation to the binomial. From a bit of a different perspective, it's reasonable to think that these crashes are occurring randomly and independently of one another, at least to a reasonable approximation. But it would be pretty tough to pin down the value of lambda, the mean number of crashes in the time period, even if we had a lot of historical data. The probability of crashing has been decreasing through time with better safety standards and technology. But the number of flights has been increasing over the years, which would tend to increase the number of crashes. So it might be a little tough to estimate lambda. But overall, the Poisson distribution would likely provide a pretty good approximation to the number of fatal crashes in a time period. How about this very different but related question? Would the number of fatalities in commercial airline crashes follow a Poisson distribution? Here again, we're counting up the number of times an event occurs in a given time frame, so that might lead us to think about the Poisson. And there are a very large number of people flying, and each one of them has a tiny chance of dying on any given flight. So that again might lead us to think the Poisson model might be reasonable. But it's not. Here the events are most definitely not occurring independently of one another. If you are sitting on the tarmac waiting to take off, and you somehow are given the information that the plane that is too ahead of you on the runway will have a fatal accident that day, that doesn't affect your chances of having a fatal accident that day too much. However, if somehow you are given the information that the person two seats away from you is going to die in a fatal plane crash that day, that is very, very, very bad news for you. So that's my argument as to why the number of crashes might have approximately a Poisson distribution, but the number of fatalities most definitely would not. Let's see if the data bears that out. Here are plots of the number of fatal crashes and number of fatalities for U.S. commercial airlines between 1982 and 2012, courtesy of data from the National Transportation Safety Board. These plots might look similar, but take a close look at the axes. In the plot of the number of crashes, the events range from 0, which happened 9 times, to 5, which happened 3 times. The number of fatalities is zero in those same five years, of course, but it has massive spikes to over 400 in two of the years. Some crashes result in hundreds of deaths, and those deaths are most definitely not occurring independently. A Poisson model simply cannot handle situations where zeros are very likely, but several hundred events are also reasonably likely as well. In a Poisson model, seeing numbers like this is nearly impossible. So the number of fatalities most definitely does not follow a Poisson distribution. But the number of crashes in a given time period likely follows approximately a Poisson distribution, although it might be tough to give a good estimate of lambda, especially if we are trying to predict the future. There were three years in a row with zero crashes. Is that a real effect due to better safety standards, or is that just a fortunate run, or some combination of those two things? It's awfully tough to say. To sum up, it can be difficult to determine if a random variable has a Poisson distribution, and it's definitely trickier than some sources make it out to be. <laughs>